Okay, ladies and gentlemen, a um, uh, very good afternoon for all. This is the breakout before last, and so we'll just make this a uh, slow start. Um, thank you for joining us today in the, uh, in the RIC, or the RIA, as we like to call it in TIP, uh, breakout session. So we do have a, uh, a kind of a busy schedule today. Um, so hopefully um, it'll be an interesting breakout session. Um, we have a mixture of operators, subject matter experts, um, vendors to come here and discuss, tell us more about uh, how will they be able to drive the, uh, the adoption of, of FRIC. Now, so we will be starting, um, Patrick Lopez will be telling us more about the, the RIC um, landscape. Uh, he issued um, a market research paper a few weeks ago, so he'll give, give us more insights on, on that. And then we have our first panel um, that will be moderated by Richard McKinsey from Bridge Telecom, and he will tell us how um, uh, RIC can be accelerate RIC's adoption. Um, and then we would have um, uh, a Vayavi presentation that they will tell us um, how they can deploy um, uh, and test the, uh, the RIC platform, and then followed by another panel um, and this is the relationship between the public and private um, collaborate, uh, collaboration in the, in the RIC space. And then we will con conclude the breakout session with a technology presentation from, from TIP, where Morley and uh, Richard will tell us more about, about that. So um, uh, I'd like to um, uh, call Patrick for, to tell us more about his, uh, his RIC landscape. All right. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, being here. Um, as I was pre preparing for that presentation, uh, I was um, remem rememorating uh, the last time I was uh, on a stage at uh, um, a Meta or Facebook event, and it was it wasn't Fuse. Uh, it was before the time of Fuse. It was uh, it was a tip forum at the time, um, and. Um, I was presenting a new initiative that was called Internet para Todos, uh, Internet for All, which was an attempt to uh, uh, connect the unconnected in Latin America. And one of the things that uh, this project uh, unveiled was that basically the connectivity uh, as uh, it was constructed until now, uh, the way we were architecting uh, mobile network wasn't really suitable for um, for rural areas. Uh, and from that observation came uh, disaggregation of the RAN, which ended up uh, giving birth to open RAN. Um, and um, when I left the stage at the TIP summit, uh, I was observing that um, if it takes a village to uh, uh, raise uh, a child, uh, it's going to take the village as well to uh, uh, make open RAN uh, successful. and. Um, well, I see a lot of familiar faces here, year after year. The village has grown a lot, and uh, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very happy uh, to see uh, how Open RAN has evolved over time. Um, well, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, running a small uh, analyst uh, practice uh, called Core Analysis, it's based in Toronto in Canada. And uh, um, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, Rick, and apps. Uh, I just uh, released a report, as Abdel was mentioning, on the topic. And um, well, because I used to be uh, VP Networks Innovation for the Telefonica Group here in Madrid, and then later on, um, Global VP of uh, Product Management for NEC. Um, unlike some of my analyst colleagues, I actually have scars uh, when it comes to deploying and integrating Open RAN uh, in Greenfield and Brownfield networks. So uh, this report is kind of my observation uh, because I, I have been able to observe the distance sometimes between what some companies say and what they actually can do. Um, and at a high level, uh, these observations here uh, are about what is the state of maturity of RAN and Open, uh, open RAN RIC specifically. So you know that uh, Open uh, that uh, RIC uh, stands for uh, Radio Access Network uh, Intelligence Controller. 
You know probably that there's no one but two RICs, a non-real-time RIC and a near-real-time RIC. Um, so the non-real-time RIC is really part of uh, the service management and orchestration field. Uh, so it is very much designed to democratize um, the management uh, of a RAN environment. Uh, and it is a direct evolution of uh, SON, self-organizing networks, OSS, uh, and EMS. And uh, the non-real-time RIC uh, is a platform uh, that is designed to host applications. And the applications that are going to be uh, developed on this platform are called our apps. The near real-time RIC, it's called RIC as well, but it's a very different animal. Uh, it is in the RAN domain. Um, and unlike the non-real-time RIC, um, it's a set of functionalities that today most of them already exist, but they're embedded within the RU, the CU, and the DU of the vendors. And what the near real-time rig does is basically provide a layer of abstraction, so another platform. And here you can feature uh, functionalities also in the form of app, and those apps are called X-apps. <clears throat> so why should we care about uh, RICs and apps. What's, what's so different about RICs and apps compared to traditional networks? Um, and I think the, what's interesting here is that, first and foremost, Open RAN generally was created to provide the same level of programmability, um, visibility, ability that you can find in traditional network, but in a multi-vendor environment. I, I think it's key to understand that we can do in traditional RAN, a lot of things. Um, you can have fantastic level of performance, of automation, um, but in a traditional RAN domain, to achieve that, you usually have to buy from one single vendor. And what that leads to over time is that, well, you're tributary to their roadmap, right? So they might be innovative, but in ways uh, and in feature set that are not necessarily for your benefit, or they might not move as fast as they could if uh, they were enti uh, uh, enticed to do so. So the first and foremost, what RIG brings is the capacity to manage RAN systems in a multi-vendor environment. So it provides observability. So at a high level, you can see the health of all the RAN elements at once, even if they're coming from different vendors. And you can see it in a way that is formalized. So you can actually see the health of all the elements the same way. Uh, the second element is the programmability. Uh, so until now, in traditional networks, you have to basically use the console and the elements of each vendor in order to go and program uh, their run. Uh, here, with the RIC, you can, for the first time, actually provide rules that can be applied to all the run elements irrespective of where the, who the vendors are. And at last, uh, maybe the element that's the most promising and that everybody's looking for is the algorithmics. Uh, because RAN, until now, the programmability of the RAM has been fairly static. You know, you can do things in the RAN related to uh, congestion, related to power savings, but it's stat static today. You, you set up rules that are based on thresholds or based on time of day, but you can change them easily. Now, what RIG brings is the program programmability based on algorithmics, so that not only the system can react faster in near real time to ch the conditions of the network, but more importantly, the system will be able somehow to predict how the network is going to behave over time. Uh, that's the power of AI, right? So being, provided that you have a long enough time series, providing that you have a, a data set that is relevant enough and your algorithmics are precise enough, you have the ability for the first time to not only observe, not only react, but also predict to what's going to happen. And if you're not convinced, the very last part, um, I mean, the promise of 5G is to create different uh, connectivity products that to happen require slicing and slicing to happen needs to be end-to-end -end. 
There's no point having slicing in the core if your transport or your RAN don't support slicing, or if they don't recognize the same slice and don't share the same slice parameters. So having a programmable RAN is an important part of being able to create those uh, slices, first in a static uh, fashion, but then as we evolve and we see the need for slices that are maybe more specialized, also you're going to need a lot of uh, capabilities to program them. I'm already late, so I'm gonna go fast. If you have questions, uh, come find me after. Um, all right. We've seen a lot uh, of applications being developed. The most popular applications are energy efficiency and spectrum optimization. Um, and, and what I found is that actually all the vendors are coming at it from very different ways. And they're using very different uh, ways to solve that very same problem. So it's very important to understand basically how um, those collapse together. You to be successful in that space, you need to understand very well how platforms work, because rigs are platform, and you need to be able to manage conflicts between the different apps, and you need to be able to offer APIs that are open, that are used by all the apps. You need also to be able to manage very well um, the data, right? You need to be able to have strong AI ML capabilities, because at the end, static implementation is not going to work very well. The closer you get to the RAN, the more reactive and even proactive you need to be, and therefore being able to use AI ML very well is important. The last part that is probably the most important is the RAN. Let's not forget the RAN, the RAN knowledge. A lot of companies are coming into that field and they might have great capabilities from uh, a cloud perspective, uh, from an AI ML perspective, but knowing the RAN very well is key to be able to understand which patterns are relevant or not and which action uh, to take. So I'll go. So these, all these companies are companies that I surveyed uh, in my study that I mentioned. And uh, I've been able to review with them um, what are the pros and cons. So what can we use RIG for? Uh, you have here uh, some of the most uh, popular uh, areas. AIML, I mean, it's great first to observe, right? To establish a baseline and understand whether there is an, an anomaly, right? So that's pattern detection. And once you've done that as a first step, then the second step is how to resolve those anomalies, right? And troubleshooting um, is key. And being able to troubleshoot at the end of the day is being able to observe and detect issues and then to observe the effect of all the changes that you make and then automating that. So that's the first use case here for AIML. I spoke a little bit about prediction. That's going to be the next frontier. Those uh, apps that are going to be able not only to correct the state of the RAN, but predict how it's going to evolve over time and predict the impact of basically switching on power reduction or switching on spectrum optimization, while well, those apps, are, they're going to be successful in the market. Um, I am late, so I'm going to go to, uh, I, I am going to conclude right now. Um, at the end of the day, um, it is an environment that has a lot of potential, a lot of potential to free up the RAN, but also to democratize access to the RAN. Uh, we were just talking about APIs, right? And there are APIs now in the RAN with the RIC and the apps, but we've seen announcements from Telefonica, from Deutsche Telekom of APIs being open from third party for developers to be able to discover and to reserve capacity in the network. The ultimate goal here is that even the RAN will be accessible. Third party will be able to de develop application and services knowing what is the state of the, the RAN, what is the health of the RAN in a specific area, and to create application that will make the best use of that. Um, so I think these are, if you want, the key takeaways there. I have a lot more to say, but um, I, I, I'm sorry uh, I ran over. Thank you very much for your patience, and uh, thank you for your time. 
And if you're wondering what that picture is, that's chat GPT rendering of an AI with an antenna on a platform. Thank you, Patrick. I'm sure you have uh, much more to say on that. But um, I hope you will be around after the breakout session so you can catch up with Patrick after the, the breakout session. So may I ask um, uh, Richard McKinsey and the panelists for the uh, adopting, adop well, Rick's adoption um, to come to stage, please. Right, so hi everybody, I'm Richard McKenzie from, from BT, um, and Abdel said that I'm going to be helping answer that question, how are we going to um, drive adoption of the RIC, but of, of course I'm the moderator, so I'm not going to provide those answers, I'm just going to ask these guys to do it for me. Um, and we've had really good panels so far this week, but this is the best one yet. We've got um, a good combination of operators, vendors, and um, test equipment vendors, um, and hopefully we'll get some interesting answers um, about the RIC. Um, but before we get going, let's do the introductions. Um, so giving everyone a chance to speak, let's, um, if you could introduce yourself, um, your company, and um, briefly what your role is um, involving the RIC. So if, if we start at the far end with Matty. Thank you. Okay, this works. So my name is Matt Tilton and I'm with AT&T. Uh, I used to introduce myself as the near real-time Rick guy. Uh, on Monday, Rob Sony, my VP, said, you can be the Rick guy. So I don't know if that was a temporary promotion or just for or permanent. But I've been working on the near real-time Rick from the very beginning. Um, we did this uh, Rick co-create where we built the OSC open source near real-time Rick platform with Nokia, so that was my introduction to, to uh, Rick and RAN in general. I, my background is actually in distributed computing, cloud computing, and those kinds of things. Um, and since then, um, I've been a PTL for the Rick App project in, at OSC for a while, and I'm a member of the TIP RIA, and so I'm still trying to make the near real-time Rick reality uh, in AT&T's network. Hello. Uh, this is uh, Raquel Garcia. Uh, I'm the responsible of the RAM planning, technology, and optimization team in the global technology unit of Telefonica, led by Enrique Blanco. Uh, in our team, we are working close together with the different operating businesses in, in the group, mainly Spain, uh, Euro, uh, UK, uh, and Germany, and also Brazil and Ispan. And uh, when we talk about uh, planning and automation, Planning and optimization, um, intelligence automation is our uh, main target. And within this activity, uh, the RIC is a hot topic uh, that we are investigating. And uh, because of that, we are also part of the TIPRIA project and we are um, learning and preparing the path uh, for going to this uh, approach. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ku. I work for Keysight Technologies. I'm a director of uh, product management with uh, Keysight basically responsible for our radio access network, ORAN, core network testing solutions. Uh, so when it comes to RIC, um, from Keysight perspective, basically you may know Keysight that we focus on test and measurement solutions. Uh, specific to RIC, I think there are two parts that we do. Number one, we actually contribute to the ORAN Alliance Working Group 2 and Working Group 3 test specifications, uh, where the reporters basically for the conformance interoperability test cases and use cases basically like energy savings using the rig, non-real-time rig, near real-time rig and the applications. Uh, from a product perspective, we collaborate with uh, operators, vendors globally, near real-time rig, non-real-time rig, except our apps in early experiments to drive the standards because we know that the standards are basically still formation in progress. Uh, so we work on some of those aspects. Again, it's good to be here today. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, Neil Coleman, part of Amdocs Mobile Network Division. Um, I have to say that I was expecting a far smaller audience for, for this session due to the timing, but I think it's a testament to how kind of central the RIC and the RAN automation is to this kind of transformation to open RAN. So as a bit of background, um, 
my focus on this panel is about run automation, the RIC, and the work that we're doing within the rear, uh, rear subgroup, and hopefully get a chance as part of the questions to talk about some of the machine learning based X apps that we delivered into Richard's BT lab um, over the last uh, couple of months. Um, I think more broadly, Amdox has been in the run automation space for the last decade. We've uh, invested extensively in companies both in the software automation space and in the network engineering area. So I think Patrick's comments about having um, this nice intersection of skills of you know, both the cloud knowledge, both the radio domain knowledge and the kind of software knowledge, I think Amdox kind of has that uh, mix, just, you know, doing a bit of PR. Uh, but again, more broadly, um, and I think you'll see this in the later session on Roma, um, we've got activities across the whole of Open RAN. So, you know, we're members of the ORAN Alliance, we're a TIP certified systems uh, integrator, uh, and we're one of the co creators of uh, ONAP. So, we have a, a mix of product and service offerings across the whole Open RAN ecosystem. Hello everyone, my name is Rafael Cardenas, I'm from Vodafone, uh, particular for the Open RAN uh, product team, which is led by, by Paco Martin. Um, yeah, my background has been basically in, in terms of radio development in, and performance. Um, and since uh, the beginning of my journey here in Vodafone, uh, we've been working in the, with, the, with the Open RAN products development. RIG has been, since the beginning, one of them, uh, especially in those applications that can overpass uh, or network performance and that basically leverage uh, what machine learning can do. Um, we've been working a lot with many different vendors and also collaborating with other organizations such as the ORA and the TIP and some other uh, projects that have been funded by, by different entities. Uh, in order to bring this innovation to, to, to our commercial networks. Um, many of the vendors, uh, we have met in them here uh, that have some clever solutions that I think without the rig uh, is going to be very, very hard to, to implement. Right, thank you everybody. Um, so, Neil's right, we've got really good attendance for such a, a late um, workshop in, in, the, in the conference. Um, and that just shows how, how much interest there is in the RIC and we've seen a lot of um, development this year in, in the maturity of, of Open RAN in general and we've got to that point where we can say a base station can achieve performance parity to just be considered as a regular E node B or G node B. But if we're going to move beyond that and actually see the benefits of Open RAN, the flexible architecture, I think that's where we need to actually start um, involving the RIC. And so, now we're looking at what are the actual commercial drivers that mean that the RIC is actually going to be deployed in the network. Um, so it could be the basic day one features of we need automation, um, we can optimize things. Is it about creating that, um, that, that true diverse and um, resilient supply chain? If you can coordinate a, a network that is multi-vendor, then, then you can deploy a network um, that's got a resilient supply chain, is that one of the drivers? Or is it more about the enabling new services? Um, and that's what we're going to start with. We're going to start with what are these key drivers, and we're going to ask the operators. So, um, Raquel, what, from, from your perspective, what, what, what are the things that you want to see from a RIC before you would consider deploying it in the live network? Mm -hmm. Um, we as a mobile operator believe that both automation and intelligence are key for achieving our targets. Performance, efficiency, time to market, and this principle, uh, in fact, we have been applying to, to the network through the CSON and DSON capabilities that we have already in place. So uh, we, we all agree that, uh, I think we all agree that uh, the CSON and DSON are the precursors of the, of the uh, automatic optimization through ARAPS and XAPS. But we want more, uh, and we believe that uh, the RIC will bring more on top of the current approach. Uh, we, we, um, our aspiration is to have this open platform with open uh, interfaces um, that uh, where we could run uh, application from, from different sources. But to go there, I think we have some challenges, and I would like to mention uh, some of them. Um, I think that it's really important to have uh, really uh, mature interfaces 
uh, that, uh, that follow the, the standard. And we want this to happen not just uh, with the new vendors, uh, the new open, ven open vendors, uh, but also with the traditional vendors, but because we want to build a platform that could manage any run vendors that we could have in the, in the network. So for us, uh, it's really important that we as an industry will push all the vendors to adopt the, the, the ORAM uh, interfaces. And I think this, this could happen, but we need to, to push. Um, on the other hand, uh, we think that uh, we need to find the, um, the, the, the best application and the best uh, use cases. Up to now, what we see is that the use cases that we see as ARAPs and XAPs are really, I would say, the same that we have in a CISOM platform or DISOM platform. And this is fine because uh, the, the, the kind of problems that we need to, to, to solve are the same. But we need to identify the value that we have when we adopt that uh, uh, architecture with this new platform, the, the cost uh, for an operator for building this new architecture, this new um, system will be uh, high. So we, we need a motivation for changing the, 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 the way we are doing things uh, We are doing things now. For example, um, our aspiration is maybe to react faster to, to the changes in the network and maybe with this uh, um, way of working, we can achieve this. Uh, we can react uh, faster, and maybe we could apply um, uh, algorithms uh, to solve uh, congestion in mass events that now is not so easy to, to solve with the, with the season and this on approach. Uh, these are some of the examples that, that we see uh, that would be uh, good to, to, to solve or, or to, least to, uh, to have right. clear. Okay, thanks. And Marty, you, you've been here since since the start of the, the RIC journey. So you've been looking at the the business drivers behind, um, particularly the near real time RIC. What do you think the the priorities are to get to a commercial deployment? Yeah, <coughs> sorry. So uh, this is a rhetorical question. Does it bother anybody else that both of those RICs are called the same thing? Because People say, we use the RIC, and then you have to ask a follow-up question. And, and Because these RICs are very different, like Patrick said. They're very different entities. Like many speakers have said, the non-real-time RIC, a part of the SMO, is, is really a improved SON platform. So it's pretty easy to take the existing SON applications and port them to a SMO platform. And even if the O1 interfaces are not available, Given that the O1 is non-real-time, using adapters to control legacy equipment is not really a problem. Um, for the near real-time RIC, um, it's, it's much more challenging, like everybody's saying. First of all, we need the E2 interface. Uh, doing adapters as a substitute for E2 just doesn't really make sense because it's, it's supposed to be near real-time, it's supposed to be very fine grain, very high granularity data. Uh, just emulating that on top of some other interface just won't work. Um, but then after we, so the E2 interface is a requirement, but then what would drive adoption is really the use cases. So the use cases that look promising are, for example, improving the uh, RAN performance like spectral efficiency or reducing number of dropped calls or reducing interference then use cases where we actually reduce cost in terms of energy saving or doing automation. And then, then of course, if there are use cases that enable new, new business or new services that can, <coughs> can increase revenue. And finally, uh, one driver that is, is maybe becoming more and more clear is, is customer demands, especially the governments in many parts of the world are pushing for open RAN. So, I'm hoping that that push continues, and, and uh, government is just an example of a customer. There could be other, other customer segments that have some special requirements that the near real-time brick could meet. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, finally, uh, Raphael, yeah. so with Vodafone, um, you've already got announcements about commercial RIC trials on, on, on your live network, so yeah, that's how have right. you gone beyond that? Yeah, um, as of today, we have been involved in, in different trials, many, many POCs, uh, most of all to test the, uh, the functionalities itself, the use cases, most of them that are, let's say, mm, proposed by, by working group one of the ORAN. 
Um, but I will say that now what we are more focused on is in order to test the, the whole platform because uh, as, as Mati was saying before, um, perhaps it's not that hard in order to have the, the, the non-real-time rig as a natural evolution of the CSOM, but we already have it in our market. So if we are start to deploy open RAM massively in different countries in all the markets that we have, uh, we do not provide the operational team that kind of platform that they already get used to that. Uh, we we will build a massive mess there. So I think that what we are going, what we are in the stage that we are right now, uh, we are testing that the part of automation, the zero touch provisioning, and also the algorithms uh, of the of the different applications can work well with the current uh, state of the art. Let's say. Um, Farther beyond of that, we can start to think about what uh, can be leveraged, especially from machine learning algorithms and also for uh, the near real-time brick applications. But uh, for that stage, uh, I think that we as operator need to uh, to demand to the RAM vendors, let's say, for, for these interfaces that are very needed in order to have the, the, the correct interaction between the DU, the CU, and the RICs. Um, as well for, for the standardization process, which is uh, undergoing and has been so far, um, be very much advanced, uh, also tightly with, very tight with the, with the 3GBP, but uh, has been a little bit of vague. Now we are kind of pushing also from, from internal Vodafone in order to try to uh, narrow it a little bit and have more specific releases in the, in the, in the specifications so that can also as well uh, help the the vendors in order to 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 productize what what they have in mind, and based on that, have the proper APIs that where where the use cases can be leveraged. So it wouldn't be um, uh, also a, a struggle in order to see if we can let's say put different applications in different rigs, not being a, a, a complete. Uh, remake of everything and, and not to reinvent the wheel every time that we want to test uh, different products. Absolutely. And um, bring it, bringing Neil into this, so uh, from a, an app developer perspective, does this reflect what you've been hearing from the operators? What, what, what X apps are the, and R apps are they, are they demanding most urgently? And uh, what's your experience there? Yeah, I, I think that's a very interesting. I think, I think, uh, I think a lot of the comments seem very uh, consistent across the panel. So what we're seeing in a lot in the requirements we're getting from operators that we're, we're working with is this kind of kind of an initial desire to kind of focus on the classical SON use cases like uh, tr you know, traffic management, automatic neighbor neighbor relations. And I, and I, I kind of get the feeling that that's the attempt to kind of get past the issues that they had with classic 3GPP SON, which was the kind of poor quality of the interfaces, the lack of vendor support. So a lot of the early apps we've been asked for are kind of ways of saying, can we do CSON and, and, and DSON and, and, uh, and can we get it right? Um, and I think that makes sense here. We're uh, obviously in the run of automation space, we have algorithms running on traditional radio access networks. So it's kind of a porting exercise for us. Uh, but I think there's a bigger, it feels to me, and I think this came across a lot in the conference that there's been a shift in kind of in language away from use cases a little bit, more to this kind of more kind of bolder concept around kind of RAN programmability. Uh, and I get the feeling that's operators wanting the capabilities and mechanisms to reach down into their networks in more novel ways to support the new types of services that they're, that they're launching. And I, and I ultimately believe, and you know, I think that's kind of, ultimately where it's going to go. I think there's going to be a very much of a push towards programmability over the next uh, 18 months. And I think there's an interesting session um, this morning about quality of experience and uh, the, I think, Meta were part of that, um, that panel as well. And I think there's something very tantalizing about this ability to connect app experiences uh, and customer experience and customer demands into this RAM programmability layer. And I think that offers a lot more scope for the kind of uh, transformations that operators are looking to, to do on their networks. Right, excellent. And um, just moving on to um, how we actually test these X apps. Um, so, Ku, you've got a lot of experience um, with um, through Plugfests testing RICs and, and the various X apps and R apps on, on them. Um, what, what's your experience so far about 
how we can use um, a RIC test platform to um, actually interact with, with the various RIC platforms, but also to demonstrate the, the benefits of the RIC. Yeah, so this is a very interesting question. I'm just trying to go back a few years ago when some key sites, right, we've been speaking to with obviously the ecosystem operators and especially the operators that we're talking to uh, includes obviously the telcos, but as well as the verticals industry players, right? So basically there are a few test baits which are being established today. They're looking at how Open RAN, especially the RIC, can actually help them deploy private networks for smart manufacturing environments. And their requirements basically converge to, you know, very similar criteria based on what you said. Uh, to be able to explore applications' ability and evaluate the gains versus complexities, cost and agility of the XAP and RAPs that can leverage AIML models to deliver the use case and SLAs that, that they want. And with a lot of XAP and RAPs, in fact, all the XAP and RAPs providers, they're asking for Keysight to emulate the network. Right? Because they will not have their DU, CUs, they will not have their partners to deploy like 10,000 of base stations, lots of cells in the live network for them to be able to train their models, optimize their models, and prove the benefits of their solutions to the operators because they don't have the base stations today. So we started a few years ago from scratch. We designed a framework whereby we can emulate networks at scale, right? what we call the E2 nodes, the CU, the DUs, RUs, the topology, number of cells, and more importantly, the channel conditions, again, in software env uh, emulator environments, and provide the mobility patterns which are required for both telco environments and the verticals factory environments. Right? This is the only approach which is scalable to enable accept and arts vendors to truly understand what they need to be able to design the algorithms for, which without, again, is a showstopper for them in terms of like where do I get the base stations. Even if you can install one base station, two base stations, you drive it using test UEs, is that enough load? Is the load realistic enough, right, for you to optimize your XAP and RS to be differentiated against the CSON and DSONs today, right? So we've been spending a lot of time on that, and throughout the, the plug phases, we've been demonstrating incremental you know, progress and maturity in that direction. And I wanted to maybe share one case study which I thought was actually really interesting because um, we'll be working with the industry partners on, okay, let's try to emulate the DUCUs, the UEs, and the near real-time rig to test the near real-time rig, non-real-time rig, XAP, RAPs, and SMO. Then we started, again, this is public information, discussing with Vodafone on the energy savings use case. And Vodafone says, if I want to be able to, you know, to design a RAP, to be able to look at dynamically modulating the CPU sleep states, for example, from Intel C0 to C6 without impacting customer experiences, how would the R app know the characteristics of the DU, CU, and the stack? You may be using accelerators from different companies, different chipsets, the latency will be different, the ability to be able to support different energy saving states are different, right? So we started an experiment that we reported in the PluckFest that as we start to look at characterizing the object that you're trying to optimize using the R apps, that would need to be characterized as well, and it has to be stored as a personality that the R app would actually have access to. And through that, there's inputs that we're basically providing to ORAN Alliance to be able to add additional models to the O1 interfaces, to the E2 interfaces for the service model, and as well as additional context from an architectural design perspective on trying to really operationalize the XAP and RX deployments right over time. Thank you. Thanks, Koo. Um, and as, as, as you mentioned there, there's, there's a lot of demand from uh, vendors. They want to be able to create lots of environments to prove that their, their XAP or their RIC platform works. Um, but as operators, we want to deploy things. We have to prove that it works in a real over-the-air environment. So there's a balance there in what do we want to demonstrate just in a functional way on an over-the-air test bed, and what do we want to test repetitively and intensely um, in a wider range of environments. So there's... there's um, there's a demand for doing both types of testing. Um, so just as a quick one for, for Neil, um, you, you've, you've had to do testing over the air and um, over an emulated environment. So to what extent do you use each? So that's a really good question. And um, I think just in fairness, we, we don't use Keysight software. We use, uh, we use Viavi as part of the ARRI 5G project, but similar, similar things. So I think in terms of the ARRI 5G, we 
we, we focus on two X app, well, two and a half X apps, one being um, coverage of capacity optimization and self-healing, along with the uh, massive MIMO uh, kind of set of, uh, set of beams. And um, I think just pulling it back slightly, I think um, these open virtualized environments have been a kind of revelation for our development teams in the fact that you know, previously in our run automation days, we were building our software in a bit of isolation and then running it in on test parts of the operators' networks, where, whereas now in our own internal development labs, uh, using the uh, you know, test and simulation software, bringing the uh, kind of the RIC and the various different network components in from Accelerant in the case of Ari 5G, our development team had complete access to like a mini network with many simulated scenarios coming out and as a result of that we saw some really nice ci cd and ct flows where a software developer you know updating the kind of self-healing app could make a code change uh, and that code change would get immediately deployed into the accelerator rig and then it would immediately run multiple test scenarios on the um on the on the rig uh, simulator and that kind of transform the way that we can kind of uh, build apps. And then I think more specifically to your question, I think the, obviously the big distinction between the over-the-air testing that we did at your, at your network and the kind of RIC test work is that the RIC test enables, you know, dozens of different uh, network scenarios. So it allows you to find all of these kind of edge cases of the apps that, that uh, maybe the developers um, Hadn't hadn't thought of, thought of though they'd be mortified if I said that. But um, but then obviously the final proof of the pudding is going over the over the air testing. And I think we found some kind of nice wrinkles between how you actually generate the data in the over the air tests and how you match the match the results up and and and, uh, and show equivalence. So I guess in summarising that like the these simulated environments give you full kind of scope of coverage of the different use cases where the over the air is that kind of final kind of end to end test that you can do to prove that it all kind of stitches yeah. together. And I think, yeah, I think we need both. Um, yeah. But there's a, there's a lot of value in these RIC test platforms. Um, apologies to the operators. I was going to, I was going to leave that question with them for the end, but we're, we're out of time. Um, but I think we've covered some of the, um, the main points, which you know, at, at the start, we, we start with, um, we really need that, that SON to be turned into an, basically an open form of SON, those are the early drivers, but then new service creation seems to be one of the, the main added values that we get from the RIC. So um, if you'll join me in um, thanking the, the panel. Um, thank you very much, guys. Thank you, Richard, and all of the panelists. Um, may I call for uh, Alton Kelly from Viavi to tell us how they can help uh, accelerate the adoption of, uh, of the RIC. So, to echo a lot of what the panel have discussed, uh, from our experience, we have took five different discussion points to help accelerate RAN intelligence. But first of all, let's define RAN intelligence. It's not just about the RIC, it's about the SON and the CSON and the existing algorithms that are out there. What we are talking about here is reducing the total cost of ownership of radio access uh, by providing a well-tested, a well-defined uh, AI and ML algorithms. So let's focus on the total cost of ownership of these platforms. So the, the five discussion points have been um, from our experience with the, the plug fests over the last number of years. And what's been really exciting about this is the breadth of use cases that we've been involved with, with all of the panelists uh, and the future panelists um, in different regions. And at the very start, it was trying to recreate what we've done in some. It's trying to say, okay, we can use these interfaces plumb them together with various vendors to make a multi-vendor environment to enable uh, a disaggregated RIC platform. And those use cases have matured throughout the plug fests, and the plug fests are continue to, to roll on. However, there are a number of areas where we can improve to try to drive down the total cost of ownership. So the first one are the algorithms, are the applications, are the use cases. 
So many of these use cases we've talked about before, massive MIMO improvement, quality of experience, um, energy efficiency. And what we see now with the PlugFest is many of these use cases come together. You cannot manage the, the energy costs of your network without taking into consideration the quality of experience of your consumers, which requires load balancing and traffic steering, which also requires uh, massive MIMO optimization because that is a big part of the network today. Uh, these antenna are energy intensive. So what we see that is that all of these discrete use cases need to come together in order to provide a total cost of ownership reduction. And this is something that is beginning to happen in the uh, forthcoming plug fest. So as, as an industry, as a group, if we can focus on the real value, uh, the real use cases that will drive down the total cost of ownership, I think then we'll get um, more critical mass behind the RIC adoption. So the second use case is about the interfaces, uh, the data sets, and the models. We've talked, the panel have just talked about the interfaces the problems with the E2 adoption. It'll be slow to roll out in the network. Uh, therefore, we need to democratize the data sets more clearly. So we need to talk more about the data sets. So at Viavi, we're opening up the data sets so that you can train the models and make those data sets available to the entire community. And those data sets will evolve over time as we learn more. But if you have standardized data sets and models, then we will have a convergence towards uh, driving down the total cost of ownership. And I agree with the, the, what the panel have said in that we need to actually have these interfaces available on the traditional macro networks. So we need to go back to the genome Bs and get their um, element management sy systems to feed us the O1 data. And we think the non-real time is the sweet spot where we can get um, the same data from um, uh, traditional networks that are deployed and new ORAN networks. The next important aspect is application benchmarking. So depending on the policy that you apply, your application might perform better or worse. And there's a methodology approach that we can apply that when you set your policies and your objectives, we can score how well the algorithm has achieved its um, outcome with the constraints from the policies. And even a small adjustment in, in, in constraints can change the performance of the algorithm. So this gives confidence to the operators to deploy the RIC and the algorithms. So therefore, we need to ensure that we have a consistent benchmarking approach across the industry to give us confidence. We heard on Monday that energy saving was um, enabled on the SON network in European operators this year because of necessity, but they were afraid to do so because they weren't confident that the, the cells might recover. So having this application um, benchmarking performance is key to, to ensuring that you have this uh, total cost um, reduction. Finally, well, we have heard this week that a lot of vendors are putting uh, consideration into conflict mitigation. So for example, one use case, if we want to increase capacity, we, we might change the tilt of an antenna, but because of energy saving, uh, you, a use case that kicks in later, it might reduce the power and negate the effect of the first application. But I think this goes back to the first point we made about you know, convergence of the use cases. All of these use cases should be driven by a single policy, and maybe we won't need conflict mitigation in the first iteration of the RIC test. It might be a little bit too compl uh, complicated. However, this is something that we also need to consider as we're deploying the RIC platforms. It's very important that the, 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 the algorithms come to a consensus of what's best for the, for the particular network. And finally, um, the data sets that we, we generate from the RIC test platforms um, help us train the algorithms, and the better the data sets, um, the better the, the resulting algorithms. So for that reason, a lot of people are talking about digital twin, and we want to encompass digital twin into the RIC. 
And what that means is that we have a model of not a generic network, but of your network. But let's not underestimate that task. So th there's four key layers that we've identified for the digital twin, where we need to get the network topology and the dynamic configuration of the network topology. Once we have that as a baseline in our tool, then we can provide data sets that map to your specific deployment. Then we need to, to know your user behavior, the data loads. And finally, we need to look at the radio propagation and channel modeling conditions in your network and look at anomalies that might happen, such as uh, expansion. So if you want to expand your network, you want to build that into your uh, scenario generation. So there's a lot of discussion in, um, around enabling digital twins of, the, of, of networks, but I think this is a journey where we need to take off and um, address each layer one at a time. So in conclusion, um, in order to ensure that um, we reduce the total cost of ownership, we, we want to make sure that this market doesn't diverge. We are in danger of divergence by having too many use cases with too many interfaces that don't interoperate. Um, there's a lot of activity in, uh, around 6G for digital twin and AI. We need to ensure that that activity aligns with the ORAN community thinking around RIC. Um, and in, in addition to the interfaces, we need to consider the data models and the data sets for those data, the data models. We talked about the legacy networks. Uh, there is not enough discussion in the ORAN community about how we in, in incorporate the data from uh, the legacy networks. We, talk, we heard about adapters and adaptation, but that introduced costs. If we encourage the, the traditional vendors who have deployed their uh, networks to have the same O1 interface, for example, to their EMS, that enables the uh, applications to run on both the existing and the future network. And that will pr help prove out the technology in a step-by-step -step, uh, manner. Finally, we heard that SON, we don't want to display SON. We, we want to uh, incorporate SON. There's also um, architectures through NWDAF that enable um, in intelligence. We want to ensure that the algorithms are compatible. And in fact, we possibly n need to rethink how, about we, how we re-control the network. So maybe we should introduce a set of APIs um, to enable that control to, to mitigate the, the workload for the adapters. Because in the meantime, it's going to be quite a while before the E2 interface is rolled out en masse in our networks. And finally, uh, this was also discussed, we need to ensure that the real-time control and the, the, the control plane of the network don't conflict. We, we are in a position now where we have some of the use cases where we can program the network through the three GPP control plane interfaces, and we need to be mindful of those as we deploy near real time. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Eltan. Um, may I invite the second panel, um, how the public and private can collaborate together to drive the RICS adoption. So I'll invite Linda Ligas from Digital Catapult and the panelists. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we had some very interesting discussions so far, and I hope you'll enjoy this panel as well. A big welcome to our panelists. Um, I am Linda Lijo, Senior Research Partner at Digital Catapult, and also working on Sony Labs, trying to drive innovation. Um, so I would like, first of all, to start with a quick round of intros. And maybe as you do that, I would love you to share your thoughts on how important it is to build an ecosystem of recap developers really for the success of Open Run and RIG in particular. Maybe starting with Ramesh, yes? Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, this is Ramesh from HCL Tech. And as HCL, uh, we have a, a SON platform uh, which we bought from Cisco, and we have got an SMO platform and our app with them. And as HCL Tech, we are focusing on X apps and near real-time RIG-based X apps to complement their approach. And uh, we've been very um, successful in contributing to the community and working with, uh, of course, VRV uh, Sandbox and developing X apps. And we now have a handful of X apps. 
and we have contributed traffic steering to the community for end-to-end -end control and AML logic. And recently, we have been uh, part of the TIP Arian win, and I'm very excited to be working uh, with the ecosystem consortium members in that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, um, Michael McGorty from VMware. Um, so I do business development for VMware in Europe, focused on our RIC. Um, and I think when I look at the RIC platforms for VMware, what we really try and push is the, the SDK that will bring in app developers, you know, both from maybe traditional telco, but from adjacent industries to, to enable them to, to work and add intelligence into the RAN network. So when I look at that, like the, the VMware and the, the RIC SDK, our partner program, we've got over 20 partners and they they kind of range from startups or spin outs from universities all the way through to the, the CSPs, the operators themselves wanting to, to develop their own applications. And I think when it comes to that, when it comes to accelerating the, the adoption of RIC to, to broadening the ecosystem, the kind of simplifying of telco and RAN specifically maybe before for for developers and, and vendors who aren't from that industry is key. So if we can take the complexity out of the RAN for them and offer up via the RIC a kind of uniform and, and simplified way for them to, to build apps, I think that will help uh, accelerate the ecosystem. Thank you, Michael. Arnaud? Yes, good afternoon, <coughs> everyone. So Arnaud Polster from uh, Acceleron. I'm heading sales and uh, product management for Acceleron. So maybe a few words on the company for those of you who don't know us. Uh, so Acceleron is a Belgian company. Uh, it's quite unusual uh, to start with. Uh, so uh, we are, uh, in our DNA, a, a no-run component developer. So we develop our own CU and our own RIG platform, which is basically the topic of the day. Uh, but we also combine this component with third-party DU and RU to provide um, uh, an open private 5G uh, solution, meaning a private 5G solution built on the open-run principles that we uh, target to, uh, to the private uh, cellular market. So as far as the RIC is concerned, which is one of the key areas of investment for, uh, for Acceleron, we've been working with, uh, with the partners here on, uh, on the different projects, among which ARI 5G. And I would say that, um, let's say, from the early days of putting our RIC platform on the market, which is dating back now from, let's say, to 2018, huh? so it's, uh, it's quite uh, a while already, we've, we've seen the need to have a proper SDK on the platform and to enable third party to develop apps on a RIC platform. <coughs> So very early, I mean, we, we put the, the or RIC platform in the hands of, uh, of operator, and uh, this is also public knowledge. I think uh, Richard here from, from BT can attest that. We've been working with BT very early, and BT was one of the first uh, app developers to develop an interference management X app on our RIC platform, and that was, let's say, in the 2020s, if I uh, remember well. But we didn't stop there. So uh, our investment in the RIC and the SDK has been a very uh, strong um, area of development for us. We've been doing multiple projects, we have now a very rich uh, ecosystem of app developers. And we recently also did with, the, with Linda and, uh, and Digital Catapult a hackathon, where we also showcase the fact that thanks to a proper SDK and a proper RIC platform, we could, let's say, very easily bring innovation to, to the RIC and to the open run ecosystem by bringing developers from totally different domains. Granted, also from the telecom world, but also developers coming from the academic world with very little knowledge of open run and run in general, which could very quickly bring innovation to the topics like energy saving. So for us, Acceleron, as an ISV, obviously having an SDK, a strong SDK is a strong area of investment, but also a key vehicle for innovation. Thank you. Chris. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Murphy from VRV Solutions. So you've already heard from uh, Altan uh, who gave the presentation about uh, RIC test specifically, and that was mentioned in the, in the previous panel. Uh, but just to give you a very high-level overview of the rest of VRV, I work for the CTO. I've got colleagues who are working in many of the working groups in the in ORAN Alliance and also take part in 3GPP, defining the standards. And we've, and we've been in ORAN Alliance since before it was ORAN Alliance, going back to the XRAN days. Uh, and then we've got a, a, a large portfolio around test, measurements, assurance, and optimization. So the, the lab test focus of the RIC test is complemented by other aspects of lab test and then portfolio that will allow you to deploy your networks, test them as you deploy them, and uh, generate network uh, birth certificates, for example. And then when you're operating the network, the assurance, measurements, uh, visualization, analytics, and optimization, we also have part of our VRV that uh, writes apps 
So we've got the, the network emulation to test them and the, and the apps themselves. T to, to Linda's question about why do we need a thriving ecosystem of, of, of app, um, app uh, uh, companies who are, are making these apps to run on the, the RICs, I think the, we've heard a lot, of, a lot in this conference about uh, new types of service. That I know there's metaverse applications being covered in other, other breakout sessions. Uh, we're expecting these networks to work in ever more, uh, more scenarios, dense urban, private networks, factories, uh, urban, um, in, in many more ways. And to deliver, uh, and I think over, over network slicing, for example, so there's more complexity coming in. There's more ways that the, the network needs to be able to operate in and deliver these high value services, which are very challenging. So it's, it, it's, it's a challenge for the industry to be able to deliver this and, and it won't necessarily be able to be delivered by a single company. So I think there will, there will be an ecosystem, a thriving ecosystem to address these challenges as we go towards 6G. Thank you, Chris. So we are on day three of this event, and I think we've heard, and the message is clear, that RIC is going to add intelligence, uh, the opportunity to build a stronger case for the adoption of open, open RAN, and potentially even you know, monetize further the network. And, and touching on what Arnold was saying, I'm personally very excited by the opportunity to attract innovators from non-teleco domains. In the UK, we've got a thriving AI community, and we've validated the, the fact that it is possible, with some training, to bring new innovators they can really build those applications and um, yeah, solve new industry challenges. Um, but we've heard on day one, there is a very high barrier to entry still for those innovators. So I would like to start with this question on how can really, really the industry nurture uh, a thriving ecosystem that reduces the barrier to entry? Maybe starting with application development, maybe with Ramesh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. Actually, uh, low latency analytics application is there across multiple industries, right? So banking or any other industry where you say at low latency application analytics is not unique to RAN. So when it comes to what, it, what is enabling that is data, right? And very fine granular data. And also the control mechanisms that need to be the decisions coming out of algorithms. So I think the open RAN industry that we are talking about, whether we name it E2 or O1, or whatever conduits in which control and data are passed through, it needs to enable this. And I don't see that open at all. It's very closed. And we have very few E2SM contracts defined today. And it's not enabling the e application developer ecosystem in a big way. So I think we just need to democratize and open it up and enable. There is a lot of differentiation at the algorithmic intelligence level. There is enough differentiation that people can bring at that layer. So opening it up is not going to lose out the, you know, the grip at that morning panel somebody was talking about. The, oh, do, you, do you open it up too much? So that's not the case at all. You have to open it up and let the application ecosystem above the true vision of marketplace. That can happen only if you open it up, not being closed today. So I think whatever we call it, I think the network, I've been in the telecom industry for till my first job in the carrier. We are so hooked up on protocols and interfaces, giving it names, E2, O1, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but the application world has moved on. And they have been, if you give them data, they will slice it, dice it, do whatever with it. And just the placement of application intelligence, components, can be in the centralized cloud or can be pushed to the edge near the place where the devices need it. All that is there, movement of application intelligence across the spectrum of cloud, all that is already existing. So we don't need to worry too much about whether we call it an R app and whether we call it an X app, and that at all can be handled by the application layer above. So I think we are too much bogged down on the semantics and taking it from a telco specific world of things and not waking up to the reality of what rest of the cloud and rest of the application world is already doing, and they're all concepts that need to be imported here and make it happen. So I think there is a lot more that needs to be done to really, you know, it's all about L2, L3 baseband uh, layer programmability. And if you do that, there is value. And in the morning QOE session, they talked about marrying the application QOE profiles onto the network. And if you do that, there is value to do. You cannot do this in the DUCU itself because they don't have that overall enrichment that you talk about. So there needs to be a layer above it, and that has that view, and then can push down the actions onto the 
ran below. So I think this is not to be evaded or just be lost out in when are you deploying, what timelines you are deploying this technology in, etc. It, it's just a question of being open and being brave to open it up and not hold you know, my data, um, I won't share my data, what, what BS is that? So I think it's, it should be opened up, enabling the ecosystem to do the job above and innovation come in, but that needs to be enabled first. I don't see that happening, unfortunately. And I'm wondering maybe, Fano, you want to add something to this. Obviously, re vendors are developing their own apps. <laughs> so how can we create you know, a level playing field for uh, the development of those applications? Yeah, I think a lot of things have been said already, but, <laughs> but I can only echo what you just said. I think we, we've been very encouraged when, we, when we've been running hackathon with players coming from other industries than, than telecom. I think what it shows at the end is that um, when you democratize the data, when you, when you get away from the complexity of the telecom world, and when you abstract the complexity in, an, in a simple SDK, I think that opens up to the innovation. And I think that's what we need, right? So I think what we need to do for these new entrants is that we need to find a way to give them access to this type of playground where they can experiment. And I think today we've been, as an industry, very closed to the, to the new entrants, right? And because everyone has his own little domain, right? But I think at the end of the day, when we, when we create playground, which can take the form of you know, a rig platform, maybe a, 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 a rig tester where people can experiment, right? With, uh, with, with simple algorithm or let's say simple, let's say use cases, I think they understand that they can bring value to this world, right? And I think it's a benefit for everyone because at the end of the day, I think I want also to echo that, uh, that, that comment uh, that, was that was just said before, I think the RIC will only bring value if we can create these hybrid apps which are creating a bridge between the open run world and the standard and the new interfaces, the new standard E201 and the legacy world, right? So there, there needs to be a level of uh, abstraction in the RIC, in the SDK, so that new entrants also don't get lost into the complexity that we are creating for ourselves in this, uh, in this transition. Thank you, Arnold. I kind of want to move into, obviously, public-private collaboration. So the UK government is investing a lot. There are uh, currently two projects, one more recently announced. Uh, we've heard earlier before about RFIG. And I kind of would like to maybe hear your thoughts, maybe starting from Chris, on how do you think those projects are adding value, you know, and in particular with RFIG, how is really showcasing the benefits of the RIC uh, to kind of making a stronger argument? So... I think there are lots of benefits here, or oh, there's lots of, thinking about RE5G specifically, it shows unequivocally that you can, you can start with some concepts, you can, you can use a, a, a network simulator like the VRV RIC test to, uh, to take some existing algorithms, so I know in the case of Amdox they were existing algorithms, as Neil said, that are already deployed on, on traditional vertically integrated networks and take them to the RIC world and validate that they can work in that, that scenario and that the find the edge cases that, uh, that don't quite work and solve those in the lab, not in the field, and then take them to the field and be confident and see that the results are, are replicated. And, and, but also thinking about non-real-time and near-real-time, we have a mix of, of more short-term, near-real-time applications as well as longer-term, non-real-time applications. We've got a, a mix of vendors, both in the in the RAN. So we've got uh, uh, we've got the uh, the um, Acceleran DRAX uh, RIC platform, and then we've got the RAN elements are provided by a mix of a mix of vendors uh, for the real network. So um, and and then yeah. So I, I think it, it's illustrating for, for a single project, we're actually getting a lot out of it. Non real time, near real time mix of vendors for the, for the RAN and for, and for the apps themselves, and uh, a mix of, of more traditionally developed app optimization applications to uh, the, the new ones. I know the Acceleran one was, was a, a new algorithm that they, they've developed for the ARI 5G. So it's, it illustrates a lot for, for, for what is a relatively modest investment from the, from the, from the partners and the, and the UK government. Thank you, Chris. Obviously, the project is still ongoing. Um, I was wondering, maybe, if I know you wanted to add something around um, some early results or lessons learned that you want to share with us all. Yeah, I, I think to me that was a very interesting project because this was assembling a, a set of partners which were all contributing to, I would say, a, an end-to-end -end result which was very positive, right? In the sense that I think we saw 
let's say, commercial vendors porting or developing apps on a rig platform. And I think that's, that's quite interesting in itself, right? To say, well, I have an app which was, a, let's say, something fairly standalone and I'm porting the algorithm easily on a, on a rig platform thanks to the SDK. And I think that's, that's already a great, uh, a great achievement. The second is, I think, the whole DevOps process, which we've already covered a bit earlier, is to, to show what is a, a good example of how an app should be developed, right? Starting with the, the, the rig test and then a, a field testing before going to, uh, to an, an actual deployment. And I think that there's also some learnings there to say, well, there's value to, to start with a, with a rig test and then to have, let's say, a test bed, which we deployed in Adastral Park to be able to test some of these use cases in a very limited scale, but still to show the, the real benefit to the, uh, to the stakeholders, right? Because I think the risk that we run is that if we only do it on simulators, that people will say, well, that's, that's great, but how can we implement that in a real network? What can the real run elements provide today, right? I think this industry is also in need of quick wins, right? We need to, let's say, to be able to, uh, to pick up the low hanging fruit uh, and to show that we can achieve, uh, let's say, rich results today even if the run elements are not yet perfect in their compliance to, to interfaces. So I think to me that was, and as you said, the, the project is not finished yet, but I think we've, we are already quite far ahead. I think there's very tangible result that we can show to the, uh, let's say, stakeholders, and in particular to the UK government to invest in that project. Thank you. And there's another project that's been recently announced, and you would have heard also in the last few days, called Ariane. So it's part of our new round of funding from the UK government. And I'm really curious to know how this project will continue to drive innovation within the RIG space. So maybe starting with Ramesh, what are your, your ambitions here? Yeah, absolutely. I think Iriane, uh, we are really happy and thankful for the opportunity to include us into that. And we really look forward to connecting our RIG apps into the RAN ecosystem and the RIG simulator ecosystem below. And uh, with the RIG, RIG platforms uh, that we would uh, you know, look at how the portability of X apps can be achieved with multiple rig platforms. And today, uh, the, the, there is a little bit of a uh, you know, question on that. So based on Ariane project work, we would like to submit our findings towards that and SDK or a report X app portability across platforms. And that is one contribution that we intend to make. Second is around uh, the interfaces and benchmarking of that. So E2 and O1, when we talk about it, you know, for um, the vision of near real time rig um, at a one second and below kind of uh, closed loop feedback times, if you really put it on to a, a production network, how much of data is going to come through and what is the size of the, size of the data lake that we are talking about and what kind of algorithmic, um, you know, intelligence uh, and the compute power that it needs below uh, for doing those algorithms, both from training and inference point of view. All this needs to be benchmarked, and we carry in our booth a benchmarking solution and a little bit of that based on what we can do today. But in Ariane, we look to have a real uh, setup and contribute back to the standards and the community overall and industry overall. So these are the two topics I think HCL Tech would be really keen on contributing. So yeah, Thank Ariane, you. Thank, Thank you, you Ramesh. Um, VMware are also in this project as part of the consortium. So Michael, maybe uh, could you tell us how do you think this project is going to maybe increase market confidence in the rig? What do you think is going to be, yes, some clear kind of outputs? Um, yeah, I think, you know, obviously having BT, an operator involved, helps to, to kind of give credence and, and kind of some degree of confidence to what we're doing in Ariane, how it translates into commercial networks. And I, I think, you know, that is important that we do need to, to set up these test environments. We need to prove it simulated and then over the air environments but it but it becomes what next then how do operators actually where's the commercial impetus for them to adopt the rick how do they deploy it you know how do they buy it even you know it, it, it's kind of new routes maybe where we need to to figure out and i think ariane can help with that with kind of looking at how does the rick move beyond how is it commercially adopted and having all of those you know everyone from test the measurement through to the RIC providers, through to application developers, and then operator involvement itself. You know, having that kind of end-to-end -end loop helps with that. So I think, you know, that that's definitely one of the things that we think Ariane can help with. I think over the, the course of the three days, we've maybe heard in some of the other kind of key main stage panels as well that 
maybe some of the bigger vendors are saying like no more testing it, it's now time for for deployment but we need to marry that that we're also saying we want to bring in small startups or people from adjacent industries into the RIC but they need to prove their their algorithms their applications with those vendors and so I think projects like Ariane are really important to that to, to getting the commitment from the the, the ORAN vendors to participate in this kind of proving of the applications, but as well to get interest then from, from those kind of startups and outsiders that we want to attract to the X app and our app development. And maybe touching on um, you know deployment. Obviously, some of you have been working on R&D project for quite a while. Maybe, Michael, can you tell us what do you think are the success factors for applying public funding um, to uh, you know, create deployment ready RIC um, you know, applications? Yeah, um, there was an interesting session held by, I think it may have been DCMS back then, but, but DC basically about 12, 12 months ago, where they invited all of the industry to say, if we were to, to fund more projects, you know, what should we fund? What would be valuable to the industry and ultimately to the operators? And I think that's, that's very helpful. So I guess in the interest of time, I'll be brief. But to, um, to, to make sure that what we deliver from these projects is important and is valuable to the operators and ultimately the people who will buy and consume it. I think getting their input at the very start before you define the projects, before you award the grants is key to that. So like a two-way discussion, continue to com communicate and collaborate. Chris, anything you want to add on that? Yeah, I think there's many success criteria that the government should be, governments, the various governments who are providing funding, it's not just the UK government, uh, there's many success criteria they can look to from everything from feeding into standards to and the, uh, the RN Alliance specifications, for example, through to uh, fostering a, a startup environment or economic environment where the, the players, stakeholders can flourish. I, th I think wh where it can come into its own is you know, we're focusing on the applications, the X app, R app use cases. <clears throat> As Neil from Amdocs mentioned earlier, we're, we can start to look away from a, a narrow focus on the on the use cases themselves and start to say, well, actually, it, we, we've got to develop these things and they've then got to be tested in the lab and then, and then deployed. But we don't, it doesn't stop there because the, the vendors continue to develop, innovate and improve their algorithms. The networks themselves evolve, the subscribers change and the, the applications they want to use changes. So it's not just a, a once and for all, it's a whole life cycle. Once you've got your network deployed with its apps, how do you bring that, a representation of that back into the, into the lab? So you've got a digital twin into which you can, you can use as, as the basis of testing for the next generation of the apps or the next release of the, the apps that you have. Uh, so it's what, the, what the government funding can do is to, is to help to unlock some of these, these next, uh, next steps that we need to, to take which uh, maybe have some high risk around, they need some investment, they can help to, to short circuit that. And this is only the first step. I mean, that, that was one example, the digital twin, but as we go towards 6G with a more programmable, uh, um, like re, um, reconfigurable intelligent services are going to be a thing, they're going to have to be, seem to be included and modeled and, and dealt with in these intelligent algorithms. You know, the, the, the industry has many challenges ahead of it and, and we need, ways to, to focus efforts on solving these problems. Thank you, Chris. We've got time for one more question, and we are at the end and wrapping up. Um, so as you know, I mean, TIP has got the RIA subgroup, so working with the MNOs to identify use cases and requirements. What, how, what else do you think TIP could do um, to kind of continue driving a sustained growth of third-party application developers? Maybe in a few words, starting from Ramesh. Yeah, so I think... Uh, <coughs> One of the main aspects uh, that we talked about before is the, the control plane and user plane programmability is new, and that is possible with the real time RIC and X apps hugging closer to the edge of the network. That is where it can happen, not in the cloud or centralized cloud. So I think that is the new newness in the overall 5G architecture, right? So everything else is a rehash of, or re-architecting, a technical debt, if you will, from you know, so on world, it's there, everything else is there. This is the 5G monetization possibility, at, right? At, that is the promise. And, but I think we, we are not having that much of focus on the ground on, on this, especially because the 5G monetization is a trouble for operators, but 
they're not focusing on that, but they're deploying SMO and ON only kind of things. It's taking the easy path, it looks like, but the slicing and the QoE that we talked about is predominantly actionable on the near real time rate. And I think we need to discuss more and iterate and take this technology forward. And, um, and, and the critical success factors of these programs, I think, is to show the way forward and come up with something that works within a sandbox and then contribute back to the standards, and contribute back to the industry and take it forward, right? So that is, I think, the government funding uh, critical success factor. I think they should put that as an expectation, saying, hey, do something which is beyond what is already stated and take it forward and contribute back and then drive consensus in the industry. I think. Yeah. Thank you. I think. Time is up, unfortunately. But thank you so much for your contribution. Thank you all for listening. Please join me in a big round of applause for our panel. Thank you, Linda, and the, and the panelists. The time is tight, so apologies for that. We have a busy schedule. So the last uh, part of today's breakout session is the technology update on the uh, RIA subgroup. So I'll ask Richard and, and Morley to, uh, to come here and present. Yeah, excellent. Right, so, yep, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll skip through these and provide a very um, high-level summary of the, the progress of, of the TIP-RIA group, um, and then Morelli's gonna do the, the last couple of minutes to talk about um, what our focus areas are going to be um, going into the future. Um, so, if there's one thing we can say that we've really achieved as, as a group in Tipria, we've, we've given focus to um, the development of the RIC. There's so many things that the, the RIC can potentially do, but we have to make sure that there's um, a way for the, the developers to focus on the right solutions and the, the, the real drivers that will lead to a commercial deployment. So what we've done as, as a community, and particularly with the operators in the group, we've identified what are those prioritized use cases, and then, um, collaborating together um, across, the, across the globe in different community labs. We've developed and focused on different use cases across different labs, brought the results back and shared them with the rest of the group. So it's really helped, um, helped uh, us to address such a wide variety of um, scenarios. And one of the things to look out for um, th that really reflects the maturity of the RIC um, is the badges. So. For, so what you'll see at the bottom of this, we've got the, the bronze, silver, gold badges. We've started issuing these. So the bronze badge simply means that a developer um, has a solution that, that satisfies the requirements of a particular use case. The, the silver badge is more about you've actually demonstrated that in a third party lab. Um, and then the one that we all want to get, the gold badge, which means you've demonstrated it in a commercial deployment. So we've We've issued quite a lot of bronze badges. Um, we've issued some silvers. We haven't issued any golds yet. So um, when we come to this event next year, hopefully it's a, a wide selection and we're just trying to find the best ones to promote. So this is, this is a brief overview of what the, what the use cases are right now. So it's, we've tried not to make it a, a long list, but it is getting longer over time. So this is how it's grown over the last two years. Um, and we've put it in sort of maturity order, so the, the things at the top, um, traffic steering, power management, those are the ones where we've got the most solutions and the, the best adoption so far. So as you'll see, we've got um, the, the left column, how many, how many solutions actually satisfy those requirements, um, and then we say how many of those solutions are actually ready right now, and how many are just in the committed roadmap, um, and then we'll see how many badges have been issued, and the final co column is um, sort of, have we demonstrated that in any external projects? Um, but as, as you go down, you'll see that it's, it's the, the less and less mature use cases. And in fact, at the bottom, those are the ones, those are the new use cases. So we've only just added those to our list. And that's a reflection of our engagement with other industry groups. So um, these are use cases on energy saving, which um, have come out of the, um, use case group within, within the ORAN Alliance and is also promoted by the Open RAN MOU group. So moving on to a few, just a couple of examples. So these are two silver badge winners. Um, so 
One is for the uplink channel estimation. So that's a good example of a use case um, that really enables um, the RIC to provide value for massive MIMO deployments. So if we can, in a TDD system, if we can more accurately estimate the uplink channel, we can do more accurate downlink beam forming, so much better performance in, in a variety of scenarios. So there's real value there. And what we've seen here with IRA, they've, they've um, demonstrated their X app, which does uplink channel, um, uplink channel um, performance estimation. And we've compared that with the actual channel by, use, by using a Viavi channel emulator. So we can actually see what is the error between the estimated channel and the, and the real emulated channel. And so we can actually see how accurate we are. So that's a very good example of, um, of, a RIC, of, of, a, of an X app on the RIC that's actually able to exploit um, AI and machine learning techniques. Um, and then on the right hand side, we've got another example, which is about um, traffic steering and predictive load balancing. So this is all about being proactive. Rather than waiting for the network to become congested and then do load balancing, can we predict when that's going to happen and take action so that we, um, we improve user experience? So these are a couple of examples of um, external projects that have, that have demonstrated the um, TIP use cases. So in the, in the previous panel session, we were talking about the ARRI 5G project, um, which is just wrapping up, and um, the next project, which is getting started, which is Ariane, uh, which apparently is pronounced Ariane, so I've been doing that wrong. Um, but what we'll see from all of these by taking part in this activity, all of these different X apps that have been developed and, and demonstrated will, will achieve a silver badge, but we're hoping that this will also lead to the opportunities to start issuing gold badges as well. And just to give you an example of what it looks like where I work, this is Adastral Park. So this is what we have as, as our open run test environment. So we do testing in our lab. We, will, we use RIC test um, facilities to, to do automated testing, um, but we're also very um, interested in demonstrating that Open RAN works over the air. Unless you show it working over the air, it's hard to get um, people to commit to a deployment. So every time we, we demonstrate something in a RIC test environment, that we then want to move into the over the air environment. So this is what we've been doing. We're just wrapping up that, that testing with ARRI 5G, and hopefully um, in the next few months we'll transition on to the Ariana project. Um, so I'll now pass you over to Morali, who will take you through what we're going to be doing in the next, next, well, next few months. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Um, for s those of you that don't know me, I'm Morali Ranganathan, the technical lead for the RIA program within TIP, Open RAN, and I own, I'm part of Meta. So we've been promoting some of these technologies and some of the work we do as well. So I want to... Uh, a lot of things have been discussed today about uh, the maturity of the RIC apps, the maturity of the RIC platform. Clearly, there's evidence that we've achieved a lot, working with operators, working with vendors, uh, taking solutions clearly to the next level of uh, uh, trials and, uh, and, and external partners that have been funding some of the projects as well. But I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts on what else can we do on top of what we've achieved so far. Uh, and to recap, clearly, the the goal of our RIC applications, the benefit of RIC applications is to address some of the challenges that we face today and we will face, continue to face in the future on optimizing and managing radios. Uh, also, uh, achieving a level of consistent performance for all our apps um, so that the app families, you know, I come from Meta, so we have a lot of apps that depend on a consistent, consistently performing radio network and a RIC is a big part of, um, you know, our, us. Uh, and, and as operators and us as application providers being able to achieve that. Um, so we want to, our goal is to elevate the quality of experience for all users in all environments uh, during any time of day uh, where they exercise or use the network. Um, so in order for us to meet that promise, we have to test these RIC apps under different conditions in a variety of, a variety of conditions, stress test them, performance test them, load test them, and one of the challenges that, we've, that has been pointed out to us all day today and throughout this uh, conference is that it's hard to get data that represents these demanding RF conditions. Um, but, but we do have to have the data in order to uh, prove the validity of the applications and the results clearly have to show that they are adding value. Um, so uh, clearly a lot of AIML has been used in the application layer. So clearly everything that we built in Rio 
has some ML component or we, ML component in it. We almost ask the vendors uh, to make it a mandatory, uh, you know, requirement when they bring the uh, use case to RIA that there is some ML. And you've seen the two examples that Richard mentioned had, uh, you know, a good uh, piece of ML built into it. But what is not matched right now is the same machine learning expertise in the data, um, you know, the data feeding process. So the Still, I call it synthetic data in the data creation process. So I have an, kind of an answer to that question here. Um, what we'd like to do is to uh, create ML models that can soak in the real world in one of our operators' networks and then uh, learn or get trained based on the real world data. And then that model could be brought into a we are, we are a key site for test simulator environment. Um, and so call that digital twin, right? That's the term we've been using so far. Um, and, and, and so far what we've done is a project that Meta created a couple of years ago. We call it an artificial twin. Um, when Meta kind of stopped working actively on the open RAN uh, areas, we decided to contribute a lot of our work to Linux Foundation. Um, to support that, we created a community under Linux Foundation called LF for Connectivity, and you can see in the last bullet a mention of that. Um, so if you go to this website, lfconnectivity.dev, uh, you will see multiple projects contributed by Meta uh, to Linux Foundation. And Maverick is one of the projects that represents the digital twin. So it's an artificial twin. It's an open source contribution, which means you go there, click on the link, you uh, are basically taken to a, a GitHub website where all the code's there, all the instructions for setting up the twin, and all you need now is data from an operator to train the model and then bring that model into a test environment for testing RIC apps. So that's the purpose. So that's uh, something that I'd encourage all of you to take a look at since it's now open source and take advantage of it and take it to the next level. What we have today is a um, RF digital twin, meaning it can do um, you know, RF, uh, RSRP, RSRQ, uh, interference management type predictions. Uh, what we'd like to take it to next is like a traffic model predictor and a you know, handover model predictor and so on. There's a lot of information there on the website, so I'd like you to uh, take a look at that. Um, so, uh, um, finally, I'd like to, uh, uh, well, this is just a picture that shows what this model is all about. I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through it, but the idea is that this twin ends up in a RIC development or a test environment. And at the bottom, you can see that there are different types of models that we'd like to work with. Um, so the, there's a mobility model, a traffic model, an artificial twin. The artificial twin is what the, the coding uh, code is that you'll find in the open source contribution. The rest of them are ideas that we've kind of captured, uh, but yet to be built uh, through the LF, Linux Foundation as a community. Um, on the left is a lot of kind of the benefits of having this twin. I think all of us understand it, so I won't spend time on that. Um, I, as a summary, I'd like to leave you with a seven-step program on how we can uh, make the rec more successful than where it is today. Uh, clearly, use cases are, are of importance, so we've thrived on defining the use cases in RIA. Uh, we want to continue to uh, you know, move along on that path and create more use cases that are compelling. Um, that also um, exposes the value of having a near real-time platform, the value of collecting data in near real-time. I think a lot could be done uh, by having this near real-timeness, especially for improving quality of experience of our apps um, uh, that couldn't be done before with SON type, uh, you know, non-real-time platforms. Uh, we also have heard a lot today about the RIC apps, vendors building apps. We want to see a multiplicity of this. We don't want one vendor building one app. We want one app to be built by multiple vendors. So we get that flavor, the differentiation, and it also creates some kind of resiliency in our supply chain. So an operator doesn't have to depend on one vendor being there forever. Uh, you know, nurturing, supporting, building, uh, or, or continuing to have multiple releases of that app. But you have a supply chain now of apps, and so operators can continue to try out different apps and pick, you know, let's say you, you've achieved the value of one app, there's, a diff there's a, another a solution for the same use case, let's pick the other vendor and then continue to test the differentiation that that vendor brings along. Similarly, RIC platforms, we want these apps built by these vendors to be working on multiple RIC platforms. So uh, portability, SDKs, APIs, they're all really important uh, to make that, uh, to achieve that dream of a single app working across RIC platforms. So that's my third point. And the fourth point we talked about a lot today was reducing that barrier of entry. We want small companies, universities, anybody with an idea to be able to come to a RIC platform and build an app. 
that's the world we want to be in going forward. Um, and then evaluation of, evaluation of testing, we just talked about the digital twin. And again, Meta will continue to contribute ML capabilities, uh, whether it's PyTorch or any of our fundamental libraries to enable these types of solutions. And we're interested in those solutions as much as all of you are. And finally, um, the way we promote and let the world know that these apps exist and these capabilities exist is through badging, as Richard mentioned. So come to TIP. Uh, you know, we're happy to take your results, you know, do more trials, and then take you through that badging process. Um, and what's m more important than anything that I've so just mentioned so far is sharing of results. Operators, if we do a trial with one operator, like the trials we're doing at BT, if we don't publish those results to TIP and make it known to all the other operators, and, and not just operators, even third parties that want to build apps, they can look at the successes of the apps that have been built by other companies, and that propels our market, creates a larger ecosystem, and that's what we're all looking for. So with that, uh, I, I'm, I guess we're concluding this session. Thank you all for being here, and uh, it was a great journey, and I'm sure this will continue forever. Thank you. Thank you, Morley and Richard. Um, uh, I think we can conclude our breakout session, so thank you for everyone who attended here, and I would like to remind you that there's still another breakout session at half four that will be um, augmenting innovation through orchestration and automation. That is an exciting um, uh, breakout session as well. It is the last one, and hope that I see some, at least some of you uh, there. So thank you very much, and uh, see you. Bye.